And everybody said, Amen. Father, we thank you for this time. Thank you for the training. And thank you because you have a great scene prepared for everyone. We're asking, O oh Lord, that tonight you speak to every heart unmistakably in Jesus' name. We're asking, O oh Lord, that your word will not just pass over our shoulders, will penetrate our heart, will revive us, will quicken us, will give us passionate souls in Jesus' name. Open your word to everyone. And Lord, we pray we'll not be hearers of the word only, we'll be doers of the word. Amen. And confirm all the things you are going to speak to us in your word, in every heart, every life, in Jesus' name. We well, thank you because we know you have answered. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. 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 We're coming to Matthew chapter 16. And I'm reading from verse 26, Matthew 16, verse 26. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his own soul? Tonight we're looking at the message, Passion for Souls, number one. Passion for your own soul, for your own soul to be saved, and for your own soul to keep saved. Number two, passion for the souls of members of your family. What shall it profit you if you gained the whole world and you lost the soul of your wife, or the soul of your husband, or the soul of any of your children? What will you give in exchange for the souls? of your own family. Not only that, what shall he profit a man? If he gained the whole world, he's too busy about the things of the world, about business, about money, about education, about whatever, that he does not think of the souls of the people around him, his friends, his neighbors, his classmates, his co-workers, of the people that have been very close to him, what shall he profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? The soul of members of the family and the soul of friends and neighbors, or what shall a man give in exchange for lost souls? We're coming to Mark chapter 8, and I'm reading from verse 36. Mark chapter 8, verse 36. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? What shall it profit a minister, a preacher of the world, or a soul winner if he gains the whole world? Think about a minister rallying together, collecting together, gathering together all the people in the community. But he's not preaching the truth to them. Think about a minister, a preacher that looks at the whole of our city and all the city run after him. And he can keep all that city as a congregation. And yet, because he is sinner friendly. And he's not going to tell, he's not going to preach the real truth of God so that the people will make him popular. What shall he profit a minister? If he were to gain the whole world, even all the people of the world, and yet in the process he compromises and he loses his own soul, what will he give in exchange for his own soul? There are people that concentrate and they focus their lives on a goal to make money, on a goal to get this and to get that. They want a house there, they want a mansion there, they want an edifice there, they want something every place. What shall it profit a trader or profit a businessman or profit anyone if he were able to gain all the property in the world and he lost his own soul? 
or what shall he give in exchange for his soul? We're coming to Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, I'm reading from verse 25. Luke chapter 9, verse 25. For what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away? And there are people that are they're always looking for advantage and profit. What can I get out of that? What can I take away from that? What's the profit for me in that? What if you add all the advantages? Advantages in politics. Advantages in prosperity. Advantages in popularity. Advantages in everything. And what shall it profit you? If you were to gain the whole world and in the process you lose yourself, you lose your life, you lose your goal, you lose your mind, and you lose your future, and then be cast away. All these uh, evangelists, Matthew, Mark, and Luke recorded this. And the thing that gives us is that number one, it's good for me to run after souls. It's good for me to evangelize. It's good for me to win souls. But number one, I think about my soul. Am I saved? Am I keeping saved? In the places I go, in the contacts I make, in the things I do, in the connections I have in my life, do they take the watchfulness over my soul away from me? Does somebody uplift profit, prosperity, gain in my sight, and the promises they give me, does that derail me that I'm not thinking of my soul anymore? And in my working for God, I want it to succeed in the work of God. Am I so intent on success? Am I so intent on uh, progress. Am I so intent on wanting to gather people together? I want to gain the whole world. I want to be the number one minister and the number one preacher of a ministry that gets all the world together. The only challenge is to do that and for them to listen to me. I have to let down this standard, let down that standard, let down that standard. What shall it profit a preacher, a pastor? If he were to gain the whole world and then he loses himself, he throws himself away and then is cast away. That's why Paul the Apostle said that he brought his body into subjection so that after preaching to others, he will not be, tell me somebody there, a cast away. I pray he will not be a cast away. While we're preaching, while we're laboring, while we're ministering, we're still watching over our souls so that we will not perish. But now, the closest person to you, your wife, your husband, your children, you're thinking of your children making it. And like my own father used to say, that where he didn't get to, he wanted me to get there. And the studies he didn't have, and the education he didn't have, he wanted me by all means to get it. But thank God, getting education did not take away my soul from me. What shall it profit a father, a mother, if the child will gain the whole world, all the education in the world? My child must be there. My child must be there. If any person's child is there, mine must be there. What shall he profit you? If you gain, or if your child gains all the education, all the position, all the power, all the recognition in the world, and then the soul of that child is lost. The people that have great, great ambition for members of their church. I want members of my church to have that place in politics, that position in business, and that other exalted high promotion in that place. And some of these people say, 
I don't care about the price we have to pay. Whatever we will do, that we will place one of our members there, one of our members there, one of our members there, we will pay the price. We might have to compromise a little and not keep on emphasizing what we're emphasizing so that the people will know that we are for them and we want to serve them. What will it profit you? If the members of the church were to gain the whole world, one there, one there, one there, and then those members lose their soul. What will you give in exchange for the souls of the members? Passion for your own soul. Passion for the people that are near you. Passion for all members of the church. Passion for the new converts. As we reach out to them, we're not after their money. We're not after their position. We're not after anything they have. We're after their souls to be saved. And this is the passion the Lord is requesting, requiring from you and from me. Passion for souls that we run after them. We preach to them. We pray for them. We fast for them. We do everything so that they will come out of sin, come to Christ the Savior, and they'll be kept in salvation. Passion is very important. Passion produces passionate people. When you have passion, you'll be seen as a passionate person. Passion compelled Moses to deliver the children of Israel out of Egypt. He forsook all the rewards he could have had because he was passionate. Let my people go. It was passion that moved David to save Israel from the Philistines. He actually put his life in his hand. And he said, this uncircumcised Philistine, I'll bring him down. Because the Philistines will not overcome, will not defeat, will not destroy the children of Israel. The king told him, you cannot do it. His brother asked him, what are you doing here? It was passion that made the man David focused. I must deliver the nation from the enemy, the Philistines. Think about Nehemiah. That was a passionate man. To forsake all the luxury of the palace and to forsake all the ease of the palace and then to run out and reach out to his people and pray and fast and seek the opportunity to reach them. Passionate Nehemiah forsook everything so that the glory of the nation can come back again. Think about Jeremiah, the weeping prophet. That was a passionate prophet. And think of Ezekiel pleading with the children of Israel to get them saved. Passion. It was passion that drove Paul the apostle to seek the salvation of the lost at the highest price at the highest sacrifice you remember his prayer his wish he said i could wish that i myself were cursed from christ that my kindred my kinsmen will be saved that's the passion that made him to say that his life wasn't anything that was considering false it was to be passionate and reach out to the people and to get them saved. That's the passion the Lord requires of us. There are passionless people. Passionless people are cold people. They can see people burning, they're cold. They can see people perishing, they're cold. What they want in life, what they're aiming at in life, is the number one thing to them. They're cold when it comes to saving souls. They look warm. Even about their own soul. If they had revelation or vision that Christ was coming tonight, they'll still be lukewarm. They'll say, it may not happen. They'll say, even if it happens, I hope, I think, I might be saved. They are not sure, and they are not willing to do anything to be very sure. It's passionless people that are insensitive, insensitive to the situation, and there is so much around them. 
and the challenges around them will not allow them to seek and then to push and to preach and to pray and to fast and to say these souls must not be lost. Passionless people, how do you describe them? Cold, lukewarm, insensitive, self-centered. If they are after money, that's the only thing they are passionate about. About souls, no. They might be in the church, a church like ours, for 10 years, 15 years, 20 years, 30 years. If they are passionless, they're self-centered. They are unconcerned. People don't have salvation. Well, they have their Bibles to read. Am I the one that is going to run after them and reach out to them and get them saved? And after all, they even tell me they go to church. I hope their preachers and priests will be telling them the right thing. Otherwise, their blood will be required at the hands of those preachers. They are unconcerned. They are complacent. They are not challenged. They couldn't care what happened to anyone. They are indifferent. They are apathetic. And they will be condemned eventually. I pray we'll rise up. I pray we'll wake up. You know, if you think about it, the people that used to do morning cry years ago, no more. The people that used to preach in the buses years ago, they do that no more. The people that used to knock on doors, and people even identified them with Jehovah's Witnesses because they were passionate. They do that no more. The people that anybody they meet and they say good morning, good afternoon, the very first thing that will come out of their mouth will be, are you born again? Are you preparing for the coming of Christ? Any conversation, they will turn it to seeking those souls to get them saved. They do that no more. Today, they are passionless. The world has taken their passion away. And the things of the world have taken their passion, their desire, and the urgency of getting souls saved has taken that away from them. If they do anything at all, it's, you know, just to gather people together so that our church will be large, so that, you know, many people will fill up that place and fill up that place, but to get so saved through repentance and faith in Christ, all that, they're forgotten. I pray God will wake us up. He'll wake me up. He'll wake you up. He'll wake every member up. And he'll wake all our preachers up in Jesus' name passion for souls. 36 we're looking at number one, the passion for priceless profit. The passion for priceless profit. Point number two, the peril of perishing people. The peril of perishing people. Point number three, the prudence of his passionate pursuit. What we we'll want is for us to have the heart, the mind, the spirit of Christ implanted unto us. Let me explain what that means. Nebuchadnezzar was a man. But when the heart of a beast was implanted into him, he ate grass like beast. He stayed outdoors like beast. And he did everything like this because out of the heart proceeds all the issues of life. And since the heart of a beast was given to him, he acted and did everything like an animal. And when the heart of Christ, the might of Christ, the spirit of Christ, the attitude of Christ is implanted in us, we will have the passion and the pursuit and the power and the progress of the Lord Jesus Christ will seek for it, will demand for it, will pray for it until the very passionate pursuit of Christ is implanted into every one of us in Jesus' name. That's an amen of a passionless person. The prudence of his Passionate pursuit. Point number one is the passion 
for priceless profit. Let's come back to Mark once again, chapter 8. And I'm reading from verse 35. Mark chapter 8, verse 35. For whosoever will save his life shall lose it. And then he goes on to say, But whosoever will lose his life for my sake, and the gospel's sake, the same shall save it. For what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? As you look at verse 35, it says, Whosoever, whosoever, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. Yeah, there are people that all the concern they have is a concern for self-preservation. I can't do that. I don't want to lose my life. Life is precious. And the people nowadays are dangerous. And if you go that way, if you even preach to them, they might hurt you. They don't appreciate people today calling them and talking to them as if what they have is not enough for them. If you tell them their religion is powerless, is worthless, and cannot save their soul, they're going to hate you for that. And so, to preserve my life, I will not tell them an unwanted truth. I'll not tell them undesirable truth. Yes, I know. I know the truth I should tell them. But if I told them that, I'll become unpopular. It says, whosoever will save his life shall lose it. There are people that have friends and they keep on a friendly basis and they always talk sweet, sweet things. And they never tell them, my friend... I want to ask you a question I never asked you before. Are you really sure if you died today, you will go to heaven? And he says, yes. And then you go on, on what basis? How can you be sure? How do you know? And then he tells you, and you say, my friend, I'm going to tell you something. That is not enough to get you to heaven. There are people that are not bold enough. In fact, they're so cowardly when they talk to their friends and they cannot bring out the real truth and say if you're going to get to heaven this is what it takes you know there are people who had their children in this church and their children are going the way of perdition and the way of perishing and they're so much afraid and they're cowardly and they cannot tell their child my child you know we're going to be separated for all eternity if you continue in this direction you will perish they cannot say that they're so much afraid to talk to their children and lose his respect and lose his appreciation I will lose her honor. She will not honor me again. She will not respect me again if I talk to her about her soul. And it says over here, whosoever shall save his life shall lose it. The Lord wants us to come out and to live for this and to live for salvation, the salvation of souls, that if we have any connection with anybody at all, it is the connection of the privilege of telling them about their salvation. And then he says, but whosoever shall lose his life, lose his friends, lose his neighbors, and lose popularity, and lose whatever, and lose opportunities, whosoever, will lose his life for my sake and for the gospel's sake that will preach the gospel, announce the gospel, tell the gospel at any cost, at all cost. It says, the same shall save it. Will have passion for souls. I didn't hear you. 
Look at Ezekiel chapter 18. And I'm reading from verse 4. Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4. Behold, all souls are mine. As the soul of the Father, so also the soul of the Son is mine. The soul that sinneth, tell me, it shall die. That death there means separation from God for all eternity. Because you understand, as we talk about the physical death, we know that saints die, preachers die, pastors die, ministers die, good people die, godly people die, but they go to heaven. And then unbelievers die, sinners die, wicked people die, they go to hell. And they are separated forever and ever from God. This is talking about separation from God forever. The soul that sinneth, it shall die. Look at verse 27. In verse 27, it says again, when the wicked man turneth away from his wickedness that he has committed, and doeth that which is lawful and right, he shall save his soul alive. That means that soul will be alive with God, alive in righteousness, alive with the Lord, because he has repented, because he has turned, because he has changed, and because he came to the Lord. And he served the Lord all through for the rest of his life. Versace. Therefore, I will judge you, O house of Israel, every one according to his ways, says the Lord God. Repent, turn around, let there be a change, and you repent and turn away from everything God hates. Everything God condemns. Everything God frowns at. And he says, make you a new heart. That's verse 31. Repent and turn yourselves from all your transgression. So iniquity shall not be your ruin. Cast away from you. How many transgressions? Tell me, tell me. All your transgressions. Don't forget that. We mustn't fall into the trap of just saying, come to Christ. That's not enough. If they come with their sins, they have not come. If they come with some belief, they have not come. If they come with superstition, they have not come. If they come without dropping all their transgressions, all their iniquities, all their sins, they have not really come. It says, cast away from you all your transgressions, whereby ye have transgressed and make you a new heart and a new spirit. For why will ye die, O house of Israel? Verse 32. For I have no pleasure in the death of him that dieth, says the Lord God. Wherefore, turn yourselves and leave ye. He wants us to be totally turned unto the Lord and to live thereby. Look at Acts chapter 2. Reading from verse 37. Acts chapter 2. We're reading from verse 37. The passion for priceless profit. The greatest profit you can make on this side of heaven is the profit of souls. Souls coming to the Lord. Souls knowing the Lord through you. Souls getting out of darkness, coming into the light, coming out of the wickedness, and coming into the grace of God, into the righteousness of God, and for those people to be added into the book of life. Acts chapter 2, I'm reading from verse 37. Now, when they heard this, they were preached in their hearts. Have you ever preached like that? That the people you're preaching to, they become so conscious of their sin. 
they become so conscious of their evil and they become so conscious of the judgment of God coming upon them that they are preached in their hearts and said unto Peter and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? They knew they had to do something. They had killed the prince of life. They had contradicted the Lord. They had said, let his blood come upon us and upon our children. They had done evil beyond calculation. And now Peter the apostle proclaimed and preached and penetrated their hearts with the truth of what they have done. And they now woke up and their conscience stirred them up and they said, men and brethren, what shall we do? Verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent. Remember, this was after Calvary. Repent. Remember, this was after the resurrection of Christ. Repent. Remember, this was after Jesus had said, it is finished. He had paid the price of their salvation. But that did not cancel the fact that they have to turn away from their sin and turn away from their iniquity. Repent in our preaching. If you are not allowed to tell people, repent. In our preaching, if you are afraid, if I told them repent, they'll say, that's deeper life doctrine. We don't want to hear that. If in your presentation of the gospel, you say, I come with good news. Well, the good news, Jesus died for you. That's not the end of the good news. They have to recognize that Jesus paid the price for the people who are willing to repent, who are willing to come out of their sins, who are willing to believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and stay away from their sins. It says repent and be baptized. How many of them? Every one of you. Repent, every one of you. Be baptized, every one of you. You see, there are people, when they're preaching to people who are older than themselves, richer than themselves, more educated than themselves, who have higher position society than themselves, before they finish every sentence, they have to add, pardon me, sir. They have to add, excuse me, sir. They have to add, if you don't mind, sir. They have to, it's like they are pleading with them, I'm not qualified to talk to you. I cannot tell you repent. In fact, I'm not going to use that word in your presence, but even to be baptized in water, pardon me, sir. If you're going to preach the word, you're not standing by yourself. You're not standing for yourself. You're standing for Christ. You're standing in the place of Christ. He sent you. You're his representative. And this is what he has commanded for you to say. And without any apology. And without any regret. And without thinking, I want to doctor the message. I want to change the message. I want to tailor the message uh, to their personality. No, you tell them the truth. Repent and be baptized. How many of them? Every one of you, in the name of Jesus Christ, for the remission, removal, forgiveness of sins, you shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. Were they offended? No, they were not offended. Anyone who wants to get saved will not be offended by the message of the gospel. Did they get annoyed? No, anyone that wants to get to heaven will not be annoyed. What did they say? Get away from our sight. Who are you to tell us that? Anyone that wants to make it to heaven, to those pearly gates, will not do that. Look at verse 14. And with many other words, did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourself, rescue yourself, withdraw yourself, come out by yourselves from this untoward generation. And they that gladly received the word. They were so happy somebody could tell them. 
They were so happy somebody could be bold enough to tell them the truth. They were so happy and so glad that somebody came to tell them, here is the way to life. Here is the way to heaven. What ye in need when you are a sincere soul and you want to get to heaven and you receive for coming to the church and you receive for being a worker in the church is that you will know the truth and you will love the truth and you will practice the truth and you will get your soul saved and keep your soul saved when you are a passionate person that all you want to know is the truth and you want to give the gospel to other people so they can be saved you're so glad somebody was bold enough to tell you. You'll not be grudging the preacher. You'll not be grudging your pastor. You'll not be grudging the evangelist. You'll not be grudging the teacher of the word of God. Because you know what he told me? He looked at me face to face and eyeball to eyeball and pointed at me and said, Repent. You know, I like the Bible, but I don't like me so direct like that. In fact, you know, he gave an illustration, and that illustration knocked my head. That was me. That's what I don't like. I like preaching that is pervasive. I like preaching that is superficial. I like preaching that is not pointed. I like preaching that just collects words together, but will not talk to my soul. They were not like that. And it says, and with many other words, did he testify? And exhort them, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Then they that gladly received his word. That's who you are. I said, That's who you are. I said, That's who you are. Gladly we receive the word of God in Jesus' name. It says, They received the word, they were baptized. And the same day, there were added unto them about 3,000 souls. Look at verse 42. And they continued steadfastly. You see that? They're not the people that you say you have won to the Lord. And then you go to them. They say, I have my own church. I have my own assembly. They say, actually, I enjoyed your word, and I like, you know, I like a deeper life, and I like your pastor, but I didn't mean that I want to leave my syncretic religion. I didn't mean that I wanted to leave my, you know, religion of darkness. I didn't mean that I wanted to leave a family religion and then fully come to Christ like that. They're not born again. When they gladly receive the word, the word of repentance, and the word of restoration, they come, they, you are not forcing them on their own. It says they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and in fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. It will start all over again. I said it will start all over again. That when the people come, they really come. And when they come, they will not turn back. I will not turn back. Our converts will not turn back. You see, there are some people, a little sin, a little smoke will get them offended. A little persecution will get them offended. A little misunderstanding will get them offended. A little denial. I want to do this. No, you cannot do that. They'll say, okay, if I cannot do that, I'm going back to where I come from. If, uh, you know, it's, uh, you know, restriction, I'll come up from among them. You cannot do that. You cannot go there. I, I cannot stay in a place where I don't have my liberty to do anything I want to do. You see, those people are not real converts. The converts are the people that hear the word of God and they give themselves to that word of God and they say, I'm praising the Lord because somebody was bold enough to tell me. And when you hear, you will not reject. You will not turn back. Looking at Hebrews chapter 10, verse 38. Hebrews 10, verse 38. Now the just shall live by faith. It's not enough to say, I repent, I must believe. I must believe that I'm saved not by the works of righteousness which I've done. I'm saved not by turning over a new leaf. I'm saved because Christ died for me on the cross of Calvary. 
and then I'm looking unto him as the author and the finisher of my faith. He is the bishop of my soul. He is the shepherd of my soul. Now, the just, they're justified because they believe in the sacrifice of Christ, shall live by faith. But if any man draw back, my soul shall have no pleasure in him. My soul shall have no pleasure in him. What does that mean? When God doesn't have pleasure in somebody, like Ephraim that is joined unto idols, and I have no pleasure in Ephraim anymore, that one that God does not have pleasure in cannot live with him, with God, forever and ever. He's separated from God for all eternity. If any man draw back, the soul of God will have no pleasure in that backslider. But we're not of them who draw back unto perdition. Those who draw back, or do they draw back to? Glorification, coronation, heaven. What do they draw back to? Backsliders draw back to perdition. And sometimes you meet a backslider and you can tell his language, his attitude, his character, his behavior, his utterances. is a backslider. And then you confront him. You say, my brother, I used to know you. And I used to know how fervent you were, how excited you were in serving the Lord. In fact, when I think of somebody being passionate, I, I, I sometimes think of you. I didn't know I would see you today. But no, the way you are now, I feel sorry for you. Are oh, you sorry for me? I'm all right. It's turned back to perdition. I'm all right. It's turned back to rejection. I'm all right. It's turned back to the evil way and to the broad road that leads to perdition. And he says, I'm all right. Is he all right? Don't give up on him. Stay with him there. Open the word of God to him there. Show him you are not all right. As he goes to church, you are not all right. If you are not living, to the light of the knowledge of the gospel you have known. You knew this before, you knew this before, you knew this before. You know in yourself that you are not living up to the light of the truth of the gospel you received before. You are not all right. We are not of them who draw back unto perdition, but unto them that believe, tell me, to the saving of the soul. That's the important thing. You believe to the saving of the soul. That's why your soul is very important. And the souls of people around you are very important. Actually, your soul is your most valuable possession. To get saved, to keep saved, is your wisest decision. The wisest decision is not about career. The wisest decision is not about business. The wisest decision is not about I got married to the right person. Your wisest decision is not something earthly, something temporal. Your wisest decision is to get your soul saved and to keep your soul saved. The most profitable life is a life fully dedicated to saving souls. You see people, and the only thing you want from them is that they will offer to follow Christ. Turn away from Satan. Turn away from sin. Turn away from self and follow Jesus, our Savior. The value of the wars of the soul is greater than the material world. The soul's value is inestimable. That's why Jesus said, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Because that soul has a value, has a worth that number one is inestimable. Number two, immeasurable. You cannot measure the value of a soul. 
any other sin in the world, you can measure how much money you have, how many houses you have, how much of this, how much of that, and all those things put together, even if you were able to get them, they are not worth your single soul. The worth of the soul is incalculable. You cannot calculate. And you cannot begin to say, okay, if I put this together, put that together, put that together, and put it on the other side of the scale, and then it will match the worth, the value of my soul. No, the soul, the value of the soul is inestimable. It is immeasurable. It is incalculable. It is incomparable. There is nothing on earth you can compare your soul to. And therefore, if you are running after everything and you lose and you leave your soul behind, and you lose Christianity behind, and you leave uh, your salvation behind, uh, you made a foolish decision because the worth of your soul is incomparable. Number five, the worth of your soul is inexchangeable. You cannot say, okay, trade by butter, give me that, and I give you my soul. That's actually what Satan wants to do. He wants to trade with you. He wants to get your soul. And he says, I give you the glories of the kingdoms of the world. I give you power. I give you possession. I give you position. I give you this. You say, no, my soul is inexchangeable. Your soul is infinite. Infinite value. Eternal value. Everlasting value. And so that's why you want to protect that soul and preserve that soul. The world does not think like this. The world is blind. That's why the world will praise a man, will praise a woman who is passionate for earthly profit. They say that man is clever. That man is cute. That man, you know, if he's pursuing something, you know, money, until he gets it, he never gives up. I wish I can be like him. I will never be like that man. I said I will never be like that man. They say, you know that man, you cannot say no to him. And you know, if he pursues a woman and he says, I'll get this woman, no matter the address of that woman, no matter the popularity of that woman, no matter the beauty of that woman, no matter what connection that woman has, this man, I'm telling you, he never gives up. And once he sets his affection, his attention on a woman, he's going to get him. And then somebody says, I wish I'm like that man. I'll never be like that man. How about you? The people that only the things they know to gun for and the things they know to pursue and the things they need not to possess, they are earthly things. And the blind world will exalt them, will praise them. But those who are passionate for eternal profit, those are the people that will be praised by heaven. I pray heaven will praise me. I bought you. I said I bought you. When you pursue things that are valuable and things that are worth pursuing and things that are inexchangeable, incomparable with anything you have in the world, heaven will shower praises upon you. Let's come to point number two now. The peril of perishing people. The peril of perishing people. Many people who are perishing, they do not know they're perishing. They are congratulating themselves, I made it. They are congratulating themselves, I got it. They are congratulating themselves, I possess it. They are congratulating themselves, you know, the passion I have, the drive I have, the pursuit I have, whatever it is, I'm not afraid of anybody. I can contact anyone. If that is where to get my prospects, my progress, my prosperity, no matter what's on the way, a lion on the way, I'll brush through and I will get it. And I think that's a good quality. They don't have passion for their soul. They don't have passion for their salvation. 
the root of passion for the salvation of people around them, all the passion they have for position, for politics, and for the things of the world, the Lord deliver us in Jesus' name. Amen. We're looking at Luke chapter 12. Luke chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 16. And he spake a parable unto them, saying, The ground of a certain rich man brought forth plentifully, and he sought within himself. He sought within himself, saying, What shall I do? Because I have no room where to bestow my fruits. And said, This will I do. I want you to notice how many times this is I. I, I, he didn't think about God. He didn't think about his soul. He didn't think about eternity. Only material possession. Are there people that say they are Christians? Are there people that say they are Bible believers? Are there people that say they are deep and life members? They have come to deep and life. They will die in deep and life. And yet, in their planning for themselves, it's all about I will, I will, I will. As they plan for their children, it's all about I will, I will. As they plan about anybody close to them, it's all about material gain. They are not passionate for their own salvation. They are not passionate for the salvation of people who are dear to them. They are not passionate about the salvation of people in their local church. Verse 18, and said, this will I do. I will pull down my bands and build greater, and there will I bestow all my fruits and my goods. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease. All they can tell their soul, the soul was still in darkness. The soul had no salvation. The soul was still under guilt and condemnation, but the soul is surrounded by the fruits of the field and the money they got from the market. And the soul is surrounded by material things. And I will say to my soul, Soul, thou hast much goods laid up for many years. Take thine ease, eat, drink, and be merry. But God said unto him, tell me. God said unto him, tell me. You might be that fool. If you live like a fool. Only for material things. You might be that fool. If you live like a fool. And all the members of your family, all you think about for them they make it in life, but they don't make it to heaven. You might be that fool that you abandon the work of God and you abandon reaching after souls and bringing them into the kingdom. And you only want to get them together for your material gain. You might be that fool. You live like a fool and you die like a fool. If you're not thinking about your soul, if you're not planning for your soul, if you're not making sure that your soul has a safe place in the kingdom of God. And God said unto him, Thou fool, this night thy soul shall be required of thee. Then... Whose shall those things be which thou hast provided? Verse 21, so is he that lays up treasure for himself. So is he that labors only for himself. So you see, that gathers, collects things together only for himself. And is not rich towards God. Reach towards God. Money doesn't make him rich because 
the currency of earth is not spent in heaven. And houses and mansions do not make people rich in the sight of God because those houses and mansions are only sand, cement, and stone, and they don't have a place recognition in heaven. Paper, certificates in the sight of God does not make anyone rich because those papers, even if they bury those certificates with a man, when he dies, termites will eat them. Those certificates don't go to heaven. I have this, I have that. Political position does not make a man rich in the sight of God. Even if you control the whole world and you gain the authority over the whole world, it doesn't make a person reach towards heaven because all those things, the kingdoms of this world, they are not transferred over there. So he see that layers of treasure for himself and it's not reach towards God. The peril of perishing people. Have you noticed some Matthew recorded it and Mark recorded it and Luke recorded it? What is a man profited? If he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul. Matthew mentions the whole world. And then Mark says, what shall it profit a man if he shall gain the whole world? Mark mentions that same thing and lose his own soul. And Luke also mentions that what is a man advantaged if he gain the whole world? The three of them mention the whole world, gaining the whole world. Number one, it's an improbable gain. You're not the only one living in the world. There are other people living in the world. And there's no way for you to gain the whole world and gain all the money in the banks of our country all the money in the banks of neighboring countries, all the money in the banks of the old of Africa, all the money in the banks of the old world, it's improbable. Improbable. And yet, there are people, they do not look at improbability. They are running after the mirage of life. I will get, I will get. Number two, it is impermanent. An impermanent gain. Impermanent gain. You see, there are people that get something today and tomorrow they lose it. The people that get something today and then the economy of the world will change and they lose it. It's an impeding gain. It impedes you. It slows you down. While you are thinking of this, you are not thinking of your soul. At the same time, it impedes you. You cannot run as fast as you ought to run because the weight of the whole world that you have gained is upon you. Number one, an improbable gain. Number two, an impermanent gain. Number three, an impeding gain. Number four, an imprisoning gain. When you gain so much and you have so much, you imprison yourself because you are saying, the more money I get, the more enemies I get. And then you want protection. And then you'll not go out here. You'll not go out there. It imprisons you. You cannot talk to people at my level, at my honor, at my achievement. How can I go on the street and talk to somebody? They will say, but you're the richest man in town. You're the richest man in the nation. You're the richest man in the continent. You're imprisoned. Such a gain is an imprisoning gain. Not only that, it's an imploding gain. It blows you up, shatters you destroys you. The gain is coming and then on the inside you're busting. You're busting. You cannot keep that thing. It's fire burning inside you and then it's an impoverishing gain. It makes you poor. You're poor in your soul. You're poor in your thinking. You're poor in reaching out to people. You want to see how that thing will increase, how that thing will expand, how that thing will, you know, just be spreading and spreading. And then uh, it's an improper gain. It doesn't help. It doesn't help. Why don't you sing and stay around here and say, Lord, I want my soul to be saved. Because if I were to gain the whole world, what does it profit me if I lost my soul? And Luke says, and be cast away. 
Such a loss is somebody against the whole world and he loses his own soul and is cast away. Number one, it's an irretrievable loss. Irretrievable loss. It's like when you pour water down, irretrievable. You cannot collect them back. And when an egg drops from your hand and falls in the ground and is broken and mixed of the doors, you cannot collect the whole egg back. Irretrievable. Are you thinking about your soul? If your soul shall be lost, if your soul should miss the glory of God, if your soul should miss salvation, and then the Lord pronounces upon that soul, lost, lost, lost forever. Irretrievable loss, number two, irreplaceable loss. Somebody loses a soul, you know, if you lose a car, you say, well, that loss in an accident, I'll buy another one, I'll replace it. If you lost uh, any property, you say, I'll get another one. It's just a matter of time. But once your soul is lost, it is irreplaceable. It's lost and lost forever. Number three, it's an irreversible loss. A person has lost something. I lost my chance when I was younger. But now I wake up. And I'm determined I'm going to get that education I didn't get when I was young. Maybe you can do that. I lost uh, this opportunity at that other time. But now I'm wiser. And now I'm more awakened. I'm going to get that again. Maybe you can do that. But for your soul, once your soul is lost, there's no second chance. Once you pass beyond this veil. It's an irreversible loss. Number four is an irreparable loss. You lose your soul, nothing to repair that. Nothing to give for that. A thousand years in hell will not repair the loss. A million years in hell will not repair the loss. It is an irreparable loss. Number five, it's an irrefutable loss. You cannot tell me, no, the soul cannot be lost like that. The Lord Jesus gave us the story of that rich man who went to hell. And in hell, he was in torment. And he said, I need a drop of water. Father Abraham saying that Lazarus, to deep his hand in water and cool my tongue, for I'm tormented in this flame. He said it, and it is irrefutable. It's real. It's real. Number six, it's an irresponsible loss. Irresponsible loss. You know, sometimes we're careless, and that thing that is lost should not have been lost. You know better than that. You know your soul is important. And you know that Jesus died for you. And you know that whatever your sins are, whatever your sins were, you could have been forgiven. And it's just a matter of getting up, coming to Christ, and repenting, and believing on the Lord Jesus Christ, and holding on to his cross. I will not let you go. I must be saved. You knew what to do. You didn't do it. If you are lost, even Satan will tell you, you are irresponsible. Demons will tell you, you are irresponsible. And all the other people can condemn you in hell. They might say, you are here. I thought you were in deeper life. And that man preached his heart out. And that man went from Genesis to Revelation. And he preached and preached and preached. And that man cried while preaching, shouted while preaching, called upon you while preaching, pointed at you while preaching. You are lost. You are irresponsible. It's an irresponsible loss. Number seven, it's an irremediable loss. No remedy. It's gone. It's gone. Forever gone. Father Abraham sent Lazarus to my five brothers in the world. And let him preach unto them. 
so that they do not come into this place. And Abraham, Abraham said, no, I cannot do that. That cannot happen. They have Moses and they have the prophets. Let them hear them. Oh no, Father Abraham, if somebody went from the dead and went to speak to them, they will repent. Father Abraham said, you know what? If they hear not Moses and the prophets, neither will they be saved, neither will they repent if one went from the grave. It's an irremediable loss. I pray your soul will not be lost. My soul will not be lost. I will not be lost. You will not be lost in Jesus' name. You know, if there's anyone there that you count money, material things, earthly things, as the big thing, the great thing, and that thing has taken you away from the church, away from the service. You know, sometimes I hear people, I'm going to such a place, I'm relocating. I say, why are you relocating? Hey, there's so much a problem here. There's so much whatever here. I'm really, where are you relocating to? I'm relocating to such and such a place. Do we have the church there that you know of that will stand on every dot of an I in the Bible, every cross of a T in the Bible, that will stand on the totality of the word of God so that your soul will be saved and preserved? Well, I'm not really sure. I'm not thinking of that now. All I'm thinking of is I just want to get out of this place and get to that place beyond. You might discover you're not wise. You might discover you forgot your soul. You left your salvation behind. You left your opportunity behind and you're gone. I pray you'll come back. You know, some people say, I cannot imagine having my wife in a place like this. I like the church. I like the Bible. But look at the community. Look at this and look at that. I might be able to endure. I'm sending my wife to the great beyond. Where? And they mentioned the place. Is there a place they were here? The undiluted word of God? Well, I'm not really sure, but all I'm concerned about now is her physical condition. Be wise, be wise. Don't become a person that is taking decision without thinking of the souls of the people you're talking about. You know, there are times that some pastors will say, I'm inviting such and such to come and preach. I'm inviting such and such to come and preach so that they help me. You know, their name can gather crowd. Their name will pull crowds. And then you ask them, are you very sure that the little you have built when they come, they will strengthen what you have built or they might say things and teach things because I think I've seen that man on the YouTube before. I've seen that man on the internet before that man. Or I know he can talk. I know he can rouse people. But he can also confuse people. Well, I don't know about that. Maybe he can. Maybe he will confuse some people. But I know he will gather crowd. They're looking for crowd. They forget that the soul, your own soul is important. And the souls of the members of the church, they're very important. I pray we'll be wise. I will be wise. I will be wise. For myself, I will be wise. For the members of the church, I will be wise. I've lost my crowd. I will be wise in Jesus' name. Ecclesiastes chapter 5. Ecclesiastes chapter 5, verse 15. As he came forth of his mother's womb, naked shall he return to go as he came. He shall take nothing of his labor, which he may carry away in his hand. And this also is a so evil, a so travail, that in all points, as he came, so shall he go. And what profit has he that has labored for the wind? 
What profit has he that has labored for the wind? Think about it. I'm asking the things of this world. I'm forgetting your soul. Are you laboring for the wind? Are you happy that the wind will blow and carry everything away? The only thing that is stable is your soul and the souls of the people you are ministering to so that whatever wind may blow, the wind will not blow your soul away. Look at chapter 17 of Jeremiah. Jeremiah chapter 17 from verse 11. As the partridge seated on eggs and hatches them not, so is seed that getteth riches and not by right. Not by right. If you are for riches, if you are for material gain, eventually you'll be cutting corners. Eventually you'll be making unlawful gain, even of your friends, even of the people that are close to you. But it says, he shall leave them in the midst of his days, and at the end shall be a fool. I will not be a fool. There are some so-called pastors. They take the money of the church, and they do business with it. And you say, when I make my gain, did you take permission from God? I'm going to take your money that is to be spent on winning souls, on helping people to get to heaven, building up lives. Did you take permission from God? I'll take your money, I'll trade with it, and when I make my gain, I return the capital to you. The man eventually dies and he leaves everything as a fool. I will not be a fool. As a pastor, I will not be a fool. As a worker, I will not be a fool. As a minister, I will not be a fool. You see the people that are too clever and the people that are, you know, aiming at this and aiming at this and aiming at that, eventually they are lost. You will not be lost. Daniel chapter 5. Daniel Chapter 5, I'm reading here from verse 27. Take care. Thou art weighed in the balances and art found wanting. Belshazzar did not think about that. He didn't think that there was a God in heaven that weighed every action, that weighed every event, that weighed every ceremony, that weighed every decision. But now thou art waged in the balances and art found wanting. Paris, the kingdom is divided and given to the Medes and the Persians. Vastati, in that night was Belshazzar, king of the Chaldeans, slain. He went into eternity without being prepared. You'll be prepared, you'll be ready. Proverbs chapter 11. I'm reading from verse 4. Proverbs 11. We're reading from verse 4. Proverbs 11, verse 4. Riches profit not in the day of wrath, in the day of judgment. Riches profit not. We're coming now to Luke chapter 9. Verse 25, Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 25. It says in verse 25, What is a man advantaged? If he gain the whole world and lose himself or be cast away. When we read it, sometimes we think of a man somewhere there. A man somewhere there. But now, read it as if Christ were talking to you in particular. For what are you advantaged, brother so-and-so? For what are you advantaged, sister so-and-so? If you gain the whole world and lose yourself and be cast away, lose yourself 
and be cast away. The gain of the whole world is not sufficient to give up your soul's salvation for. If there's anything to be kept, it will be your soul. The most important thing for you. I pray God will make you wise, make me wise, make us all wise in Jesus' name. Point number three now is the prudence of his passionate pursuit. The prudence of his passionate pursuit. What was Christ's passionate pursuit? Let's come to Luke chapter 19, verse 10. Luke chapter 19, verse 10. For the Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. That was his pursuit, his passionate pursuit. The Son of Man is come to seek and to save that which was lost. You remember a time when the people were looking for him. And they wanted to make him a king. And he ran away from them. And you remember when Pilate was talking to him. And he said, are you a king then? He said, yes, but my kingdom is not of this world. If my kingdom were of this world, then my servants will fight. You remember when Satan came and he said, bow down to me, and I will give you all the glories of the kingdoms of the world. And he said, get thee behind me, Satan. He wasn't going to trade what he had with anything in the world. And that was his pursuit. Well, have the pursuit of the Lord. Look at Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. Isaiah chapter 50. We're reading from verse 7. Isaiah chapter 50, verse 7. For the Lord God will help me. Therefore shall I not be confounded. Therefore have I said my face like a flint. And I know that I shall not be ashamed. Therefore do I set my face like a flint. If you don't make up your mind. If you don't set your mind. Like you set an alarm clock. If you don't set your will, if you don't set your life and focus your life and say, that's why I'm in the world, that's what I'm going to do in the world, I'm not going to be diverted left or right, I set my face. If you don't do that, you'll be distracted. But Jesus set his face like a flint. And what he came to do, nothing and no one could divert him. Nobody will divert you. Luke chapter 9. In Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 51. Luke chapter 9, reading from verse 51. And it came to pass when the time was come that he should be received up he steadfastly set his face to go to Jerusalem. He wanted to die for the salvation of the whole world. And that was on his mind. And he set his face just for that. That's what the Lord wants us to do. He wants us to set our affection, our attention, our goal, our mind, everything we have. On what he has left us in the world here to do and have the might of Christ. I pray tonight the Lord will give more of that to us in Jesus' name. Amen. Philippians chapter 2. Philippians chapter 2. I'm reading from verse 3. Let nothing be done or strive of in glory. You know why people have strived? I want that material thing and he's standing in my way. 
I want that position and he is standing in my way. I want that property and he is standing in my way. I want that woman and he is standing in my way. I want that man and she is standing in my way. That's why people have strived. But when you set your mind on the salvation of your soul and the salvation of people around you that the Lord had given to you, you're not looking for anything that anybody can strive with you for. And therefore, you have the mind of Christ. Let nothing be done through strife of glory, But in lowliness of mind, let each esteem other better than themselves. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Let this mind be in you, which was also in Christ Jesus. The mind that knows I'm here only for the salvation of souls, the mind that knows I set my face as a flint, and I'm not going to be distracted. Let that mind be in you. When that mind is in you, you'll have his passionate desire, his passionate pursuit. Jeremiah chapter 45, Jeremiah chapter 45, I'm reading from verse 5. In Jeremiah chapter 45, reading from verse 5, look at what it says. Verse 5, And seekest thou great things for thyself, not for the Lord? And seekest thou great things for thyself, not for the souls to be saved? And seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, seek them not, have the mind of Christ, be willing to give up anything and everything for the salvation of souls and set your mind and set your focus on gaining the salvation of people. Seekest thou great things for thyself? Seek them not, for behold, I will bring evil upon all flesh. Says the Lord, but thy life will I give unto thee. Thy soul will I give unto thee. For he pray in all places whither thou goest. Will have the mind of Christ. The greatest pursuit was that the salvation of your own soul. Your greatest pursuit to make sure that whatever else you're looking for, Whatever else you want to get, whatever else you want to possess, you don't forget the salvation of your soul. I want to get that if it will not hinder me from keeping my salvation, my steadfastness, my security, my heaven, my title to the glories of heaven, your greatest pursuit salvation of your own soul. Your greatest priority after you are saved, the seeking to save sinners. Your priority, not business, seeking to save sinners. Your priority, not money, not politics, not recognition, not prosperity. Your greatest priority, the seeking of souls to save. Your greatest passion, your greatest passion, the steadfastness of saved souls. People have gotten saved through you. They became born again through you. They came into the kingdom through you. You spent every money, all the money you have, all the material things you have, all the time you have, all the efforts you have to make them steadfast as saved souls. Number four, your greatest presence. Christ is coming. The greatest thing you present unto him, your greatest presentation is the salvation of saints. People are saved. You're not just into religion. You're not just into preaching. You're not just into ministry. You want to present to Christ when he comes, sanctified saints. Your greatest promise, the promise you have from the Lord, 
many promises in the word of God to give you this, give you this, and give you that. Your greatest promise is saturation of the Holy Ghost. Saturation of the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit is greater than money. Is greater than health, is greater than prosperity, greater than any other thing that you may think about on earth. Your greatest promise is saturation with the Holy Spirit. Your greatest privilege. What privilege are you thinking about? Privilege to walk there, walk there, have this, have that. Your greatest privilege is service to the Savior. Service for the Savior. It says, do this for me. I died for them that they might be saved. And it's the greatest privilege, the greatest honor, the greatest opportunity, the greatest privilege you can have, service for the Savior. The greatest prophecy, your greatest prophecy is shining as stars forever and ever. Some people say, I have this prophecy, I'm waiting for its fulfillment. I have that prophecy. I'm waiting for its fulfillment. The greatest prophecy you have is that you will shine forever and ever as stars in the kingdom of God. Daniel chapter 12. I'm reading from verse 3. Daniel chapter 12 verse 3. And they that be wise shall shine as the brightness of the firmament, and they that turn many to righteousness as the stars tell me forever and ever. That's the greatest prophecy you have. I pray you'll be wise. That this message will not be like the message we always hear. Praise God, we have that again. Praise God, I know that verse. This one will penetrate your heart. This one will occupy your soul. This one will turn you around and you will pray that something definite will be done. That you will leave all the mundane things of this world and more than ever before, you'll think of your soul. you think of the soul of your wife the soul of your husband, the soul of your children, the soul of your friend, the soul of your neighbors, and the soul of sinners around us. What shall you profit a man if he shall gain the whole world and lose his own soul? Or what shall a man give in exchange for his soul? Be wise and let your soul be important in your own sight, as it is important in the sight of God, and you will not throw your soul away to the hands of the devil to take it to hell in Jesus' name. Heaven is my goal. For myself, heaven is my goal. For my wife, heaven is my goal. For husband, heaven is my goal. You didn't say that. For my husband, heaven is my goal. For my children, heaven is my goal. For all neighbors around me, heaven is my goal. Rise up then and set your heart to that. That you'll not allow anything, anyone, any position, any property, anything in the world to take the salvation of your soul and the salvation of all the people's souls away from you, away from them. Open your mouth today and pray to the Lord and say, Lord, let the mind of Christ be my own mind.